Good evening. This is uh, Yudrin. How are you tonight? Is anybody with me? Um, please say hi. Come on, say hello if you're here. And um, if not, if you're watching later, I want to do a little, take a little second to sort of describe what you're looking at here. You're looking at <laughs> um, someone in the over 60 set who's been practicing um, Dharma in uh, the tradition of the yogis of Tibet, the, mostly the Nyingma tradition, if you're familiar with that. And if not, it's fine. Um, that's focused on practice. So I'm not a great scholar. My knowledge is uh, mainly of meditation, ritual, devotional knowledge, and so forth. So welcome to my world, the world of yogis in Tibet. And chime in here and let me know if you're here, anybody, by leaving a comment in the comment box. Um, it was really kind of, I'm just thinking, what I've been thinking about today was kind of a small world. of Because um, if you read the, over, the biographies, of people of um, practitioners and great practitioners in this tradition they would go and migrate to wherever the great lamas were and the encampments would arise around these great teachers um, who pr specialize in vajrayana tibetan buddhism um, which has a slightly different flavor but um, the meaning is the same <laughs> in a lot of ways, as uh, the typical Buddhism we hear about. Um, anybody there? Yep. All right. So um, it was in this kind of setting in an area called Goluk and Amdo of uh, far northeastern Tibet in which this arc, uh, the woman we're going to be contemplating with today arose um, in um, 1892. She was born, actually she was born in Lhasa, the big city, metropolitan area, which was, you know, tiny by our standards then. And um, I'll tell you about her story. How did she get way out in cowboy country, literally the area of nomads? and great faith and devotion. So practitioners go to areas like that to follow after amazing spiritual mentors, literally migrating in nomadic encampments oftentimes, or settling in a mountain retreat called the Ritra, a remote area and where a Lama is practicing and people go to join him and it becomes an amazing encampment. So in this world of encampments, uh, Sarah Condro arrived. Um, so give me a shout out if you're here. Don't see any comments so far. Um, I'm sort of stalling until I see at least one person say hi. Um, so um, uh, this house, uh, has been blessed. Lama Tarchin Pache walked here once. <laughs> I walked through the house once. Lama Pema Dorje lived here for years. Uh, uh, Rinpoche. And um, both of them have uh, got other things to do now. I'm sure they have great, wherever they are, they have great um, Dharma work that they're doing. But um, they've passed from this worldly realm. Uh, so I like to tell stories of these kind of masters and um, pass on what I've learned. And um, so, hey, Lori, great. There's the cue. I'm going to start talking about our, our friend Sarah Condro to, uh, tonight. Hey, Lori, do you know what Condro means? Yet. It's okay if you don't. Kondro, ka, ka is sky, dro is go, so uh, literally means you're going in the sky. And this is the um, realm of uh, the feminine principle, which in Tibetan Buddhism regards um, the non-conceptual mind. And the great vast expanse of space represents 
our inner attitude, our inner experience of not grasping to thoughts. Well, now you know, chondro, dakini. So we call, you know, the wives of great lamas, uh, Kandra, out of respect. And um, then there's a wide variety of different human females who represent this principle. And, but in the case of uh, Sarah Kandra Dewey Dorje, Dewey Dorje, it's phoneticized, I always look like Dew. Dewey Dorje, um, she was, um, Kandra was, is used there to mean like they, the word tuku, you've heard? Well, tuku means a uh, nirmanakaya, right? An embodied manifestation of Buddhahood. So, in other words, um, a person, I will say, a body that arose only to benefit sentient beings, only to lead sentient beings to enlightenment. Isn't that beautiful? So in the, you could call Sarakandra Tuku or Nirmanakaya Buddha, or you could say that she's uh, Khandra or Dakini, and Dakini here means this Nirmanakaya Buddha. And so like Dujum Lingpa, who we talked about last week, you know, her life was fantastical. Her inner world was fantastical, but she is so inspiring in her outer fortitude and uh, devotion and um, courage. So amazing. Um, so on my computer today, I found a little um, note to myself from the past, and this is from about 20 years ago, I guess. Um, when Tuku Songak Rinpoche um, taught at Mount Shasta. And I think it was the first time I heard her story talked about. And after that, I searched out every empowerment I could find, every book I could find, every article I could find to learn more about this amazing woman. I even wrote a book myself that she was a character in, of the novel, what do they call it? Uh, fictionalized, fictionalized something. So, um, I thought instead of reading the things that you can find online when you go searching for her, which I recommend doing, um, I would um, share with you the stories of Tukusangak Rinpoche, who's still with us and living in New Mexico, um, told at that time, as I wrote them down, you know, like I had a habit of the evening after I go to a teaching, I would I take scribble out messy notes because I'm a slob, and then I would type them up. So here's what I got, and um, if there's any inaccuracies, it's entirely my note taking. So Sarah Kondro is, is one of the few female tertans or treasure revealers, which means uh, somebody asked me last week to do a whole video on the tertan phenomena. I think that's a really good idea. Let's just say for now, though, that they are um, meditation masters who um, found... objects, practice texts, and other things um, manifest in this world, sometimes hidden, like literally behind, in, digging out a hole in a, in a cliff, and you'll find uh, the seed or the little, a little yellow scroll uh, with some mysterious script on it. And then they would, something would dawn in their mind because they were the destined they were told in their dreams and visions that this was there and this was their destiny, right, from a past life. So it requires a very much faith-based Buddhism all the way through Sarah Kondra's, uh life story. And, um, or other times something just dawned directly in their mind like they can see it. Some, some Tertans relate just being literally being able to see it written in front of them um, in its totality. And this is the re, 
Um, it's like something was hidden in their mind stream from many, many, from a thousand years ago, from Guru Rinpoche's time. Isn't that marvelous? It's a marvelous tradition. So, mostly men. And it makes sense that the, the um, in their society, which was strongly, especially out in Goluk, it was a patrilineal, what do you call it? What's the word for a uh, um, leader of a group? There's a word for it, hereditary. So like a... a um, I always go back to my public health classes. They would go to the head man, you know, <laughs> and in, in uh, Asian societies to, if they want to deal with a public health issue, first you had to go in and you meet with the head man, right? So in this, they, they don't like to say tribal, but, you know, similar kind of agrarian society. It was always led by men. Um, and so it makes sense that that's the... the portrait of strength and so forth was man in addition all the training would be available to boys from a young age and so but Sarah Condro broke the mold and um, she was at, there's a hundred great or major Teratons or treasure revealers predicted and only three were women one was uh, Condro Pema Kungabum uh, who was his uh, terma are featured in the Rinchen Terzo Lori, I know this goes beyond your knowledge base, but somebody else might be watching this next week or something. And it's a big uh, encyclopedia of our treasure teachings. Or um, Jomo Menmo, and then Sarah Kondro. So there's a definition, a technical definition, what makes you a major Teraton versus a minor Teraton in uh, certain things, a certain variety of... Um, treasure teachings or practices you need to discover. So she was an um, incarnation of Chaka Dorje Tsu. Dorje Tsu. She, Dorje Tsu was one of uh, a female uh, among Guru Rinpoche's female disciples. So the, in Tibetan Buddhism, the I'm looking at the time, <laughs> the whole um, archetype, our um, framework that we hearken back to is um, Guru Rinpoche Padmasambhava arriving in central Tibet from India and the people around him became perpetual he and the people around him the king who welcomed him and sponsored him his consorts his uh, male students, they became the template upon all which all the um, subsequent um, revelation, revelatory literature uh, has to touch base with. <laughs> There's only one or two people outside of that circle that you, have, you can say you're a, a, a tuku of um, and have it be uh, legitimate uh, treasure teaching. 99% of them go back to Guru Rinpoche, Padmasambhava, and were passed, most of them were passed down through his um, student consort, Yeshe Sogyal. So um, both Yeshe Sogyal and Chaka Dorje Tse were, were among the 32 uh, enlightened Dakinis at the time that time. So um, Dorje Tso approached Guru Rinpoche and Yeshe Sogyal, and Guru Rinpoche placed his crystal mala, his uh, prayer beads, on her head, and it dissolved into her head. Like the t Tara, the famous uh, female bodhisattva, Dorje Tso took a vow always to be reborn as a woman. Um, Tsangi Lingpa, a great treasure revealer, predicted a manifestation of Vajravarahi, a great meditational deity, female, who would benefit beings in the desire realm. The desire realm is our realm, human realm. Pema Ledritsal, 
another important figure, also predicted an emanation of Chaka would come, as did many others. Sarah Kondo was born in Lhasa near a famous temple. Her family was from China. She wasn't Tibetan, 100%. Tara appeared to her when she was eight years old. She had pure vision experiences of Saraha, Mahasiddha from great master from India, and um, Yeshisogyal, among others. When it, now, arranged marriage was the norm in those days, and um, when it came time for her arranged marriage, she escaped out of a clear story window and jumped, falling on a stone surface where it's said that the indentation of her feet can still be seen. I'm sure someone has been to go, go and look if the, see if the Chinese have paved over it yet. Uh, Hlasa is now a, a, a big, pretty big city with a lot of buildings, modern buildings. She, anyway, she left Lhasa alone. Why did she go? I skipped the whole part about why she went. So she saw a, a, some grubby yogis from from uh, Goluk, from way out in eastern Tibet. I mean, hundreds and hundreds of miles away. Needed a place to spend the night. And his, her mom or somebody gave permission for them to camp in the yard. And she looked at, this is the way I've heard the story anyway. And she looked out and she saw a magnificent lama. I can only imagine he was wearing a Zen like mine, which is, I must say, quite handsome. And, <laughs> and, and probably had, a, he was a nakbas, and they usually had, they either have their hair going down, like uh, loose, but quite often if they're traveling or whatever, they would form, form into dreads, and then they would pile them up on their head and secure it with a little... Uh, red string and so he must have looked amazing and uh, she instantly thought this is it this is my llama and I have to follow him it was like that struck by lightning and so um, they left though and a whole a whole story unfolded I think it's worth it to to while away some of our time with telling this story because um, it's a wonderful story. So, so if she jumped out of her window, you know, from height and landed and her feet went in stone, this is a typical sign of a um, tuku or nirmanakaya, a great siddha, you know, a great accomplished, meditation accomplished, that like matter doesn't, it's so unreal to them that they can just put their hand or their feet in it like mud. That's the idea. She left Lhasa alone and walked four to five days. She had nothing with her. Uh, going north, sleeping in the forest, she prayed to Guru Rinpoche for help, but eventually collapsed and nearly died. Then a horseman appeared with a big container of yogurt. I've heard this story before. This has happened to, I think, Milarepa, was it? Somebody can tell me. Hey, Hart, do you remember Milarepa's story about the yogurt arriving at the cave? I think that was, I saved him on occasion, too. Of course, there aren't that many, weren't that many food items in Old Tibet. Um, I'm just telling st stories about Sarakandra. There's so much to say. And there's n no rule that we have to go only one week about her, too. So she's wandering through the woods. She she dropped, you know, had no food, nothing, and collapsed. And this horseman appeared out of nowhere, gave her a big container of yogurt, and offered it to her with a bow. This is the Golok style of greeting visitors. They would go, somebody they knew had a guest that was arriving, they would get on horseback with yogurt and head out and meet them far away from town as a, you know, do we have that much hospitality? It's like going to an airport, but much more so, <laughs> you know, to pick somebody up. And um, so he bowed, he left the yogurt, and they still have these same kind of yogurt containers in Golik, he said. It's Ukusangak telling the story. 
And uh, later it was said, uh, ah, this was an emanation of, uh, oh, now I understand. It says Majak Pumra. That was the way I heard the accent then. Now I know it was uh, Magya, Ma, 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 Pumra. Ma, Ma Chen Pumra? One of you guys can Google it for me. Ma Chen, it's, I'm not quite there. A great, there's a mountain that has its own protective energy, and this is an embodiment of that in Golok. Um, Sarah, Golok was a place that was like Australia. <laughs> in no way at all, except that I've heard that people were exiled there, so criminals were exiled to Golok. So the Golok people are said to be the offspring of criminals and some of the greatest practitioners. Um, I would, I'm adding. There's always problems with cr thievery and crime in Golok and always has been. I don't know what it's like now under a different government, but um, it's a rough area, cowboys and... Um, agriculture mountains and some meadow pasture like meadows for grazing your cattle and your sheep and your goats so Sarah Condro Magyal Magyal Palmer Machenpa is not quite right Kirkandu arrived at a place where there was a large mani stone. A large mani stone, what's that? What's a mani? Can either of you tell me? And she was, by that time, she was completely starved and didn't have any clothing. What does the mani refer to? So she circumambulated the Mani Stone. Well, there's a clue. Must be something positive, right? So you go clockwise to show respect, and it gives you a real uplifted feeling of receiving blessings when you do that around a stupa or a Mani wall. Hint, hint. Okay, so Om Mani Padme Hum. Om Mani Padme Hum, that's the mantra of Tenrezi, Buddha of Compassion, and the national mantra of Tibet. So all Tibetans know the Mani mantra. It's totally great. Yes, yeah, you've heard that term, right? You know why? Because they carve, it's considered a merit-making activity. But that sounds so dry. Devotional activity to to carve the letters on Mani Padme Hong in rock. So you'll see these on great circumambulation routes, like around the Dalai Lama's palace in um, Dharamsala. And um, then Patra Rinpoche made a giant wall that was miles long, just of stacks of these stones that people had made. So, um, so it was probably something like that, a big wall comprised of rocks with Om Mani Padme Hum carved in it. So as she, she circumambulated, a lama saw her and invited her in and offered her prostrations. Well, this is bizarre. It's a young woman, girl, he didn't know, and he's prostrating to her, a lama. This is so uh, odd. He said he'd received many prophecies and predictions of her arrival. Immediately, he put her on a high throne. This is a sign of great respect. And requested teachings of the Dharma. And thus, one month after she left home, she gave teachings for the first time. I don't know how old she was, but very young. In this way, she imparted her visionary terma, her like treasure, 
that she'd already started discovering these inner riches um, on her first student. He provided shoes, clothes, and sampa, the staple barley flour, allowing her to travel on to Golok. But when she got to Golok, the difference in her dialect, her gender, made things very difficult. She got a job taking care of yaks, and she felt depressed and defeated. So, you know, this, there's a um, love and liberation is the um, a doctoral, re, you know, a revised doctoral dissertation on her, which presents parts of her um, autobiography with commentary by a wonderful, wonderful scholar, feminist scholar, female scholar. And um, so that's a must have. But the actual, I don't think the actual, her actual autobiography, full autobiography, uh, we have a, a there's, there were two or three maybe. There was long, short. So this is um, a very expensive, <laughs> as you can tell, it's precious of her shorter biography, which was written for people to memorize, which was uh, to um, as their devotional practice. But there's a long one, and it apparently she just spares. She's very willing to talk about how she's feeling about things. And you don't see that in the, with, very much with the male um, autobiographies. So that was, it's, it's a unique, you know, what do you call it, binoculars into um, the times. Uh, Hart, have you read um, Love and Liberation? Um, yeah, so, this is, I'm going to read what it says, but it, later I got the more exhaustive description in Love and Liberation. Um, let's see what it said here. She wanted to meet a certain Ngakpa Lama. That means a non-monastic lama, and his and his wife, an attendant, prevented him, prevented her from doing it. This went on for three years. Finally, the lama sent for her. Then both their obstacles for treasure re re revelation were cleared away on finally meeting each other. He predicted her treasures should appear now. All kinds of visions occurred. Sometime there were problems with the terima signs. At these times, this lama could help her out, and she could help him. So their um, love of each other, and uh, actually the sexual relationship, um, freed up blockages that have, were preventing these um, revelations from coming forward. And this is the quintessential story of that, where they're both helping each other. It started with, um, I think it might have been Gara, Gara Tuku, he was, she was talking about there, and things did not go well in his encampment. She was with Gara Tuku in his encampment for a while, so she, was never, she, she took, was never quite able to get to um, Tuku Drime's place, encampment. It was always obstacles, but um, she stayed with Gara Tuku for a long time as a, a sort of, there were, um, what are we going to call it? What's the word for plural marriage? was a thing. <laughs> Usually women had more than one husband because of the way property was inherited, you know. You can if you think about it, the way land would be divided up in an agrarian society and how why it would be profitable to have more than one male, like two brothers. So then you get two pieces of land that would be adjoining practical people. And um but in the treasure revealing community, uh, the lamas were um, very non-monogamous, and uh, it was considered a blessing to um, have sexual relations with the lama. Um, and it makes sense that the wife, the close wife, who was probably doing a huge amount of work managing the whole scene, would be not wanting another woman to come into the encampment. 
as the second or third or fourth wife. We can't pass judgment on these things as Americans. It's a completely different culture and time. So um, where were we? Oh, it says right here. The support of the consort has two purposes. First, through tantric training, it helps to produce and maintain the wisdom of the union of great bliss and emptiness by which the adept attained the ultimate state. Second, a realized person who has a requisite powerful aspirations takes birth as the consort of a Tertan in order to fulfill the mission of discovering the profound esoteric teachings for fortunate followers. For the Terma tradition, a consort is a very important instrument. Sometimes the support of different consorts is required for the discovery of several major scriptures by the same person because of their specific aspirations for discovery at this time of concealment. If the right person could not become the Territon's consort or be present, sometimes the gift of an ornament or an item of clothing of the person can be substituted. Because of the interdependent causation, the substituted object becomes the support of discovery, decoding the symbolic script and allowing for the propagation of teachings. So a lama predicted, I think that lama, there was, so there was a lot of drama and the honest story is told in uh, Love and Liberation. She was treated very badly in Gartoku's encampment and uh, really doing the most menial task and, and um, you know, if she, if she confessed to any, you know, re revelations or spiritual qualities at all, she'd be um, punished. So treated like a dog pretty much. And so I think this is an amazing story of fortitude in the face of adversity. And not just that, but um, certainty about where she wanted to go with her life. How many of us have a even a worldly career that we would go through that much for. Years and years she served there. Um, and she would talk about herself as um, maybe one of the reasons it hasn't been translated. I don't know. I mean, it has been translated, I think, but it hasn't been published yet. I don't know. Could be she talks about herself as um, like just, there's a, there's a cultural habit to diminish pride in yourself if you're a teacher you try to take the lowest seat in the room and you say you're really not a very good teacher and you say, oh, can't somebody else do this? Well, can't we get somebody qualified to do this? You want me to do this? You know, it's like really humble. So her way of doing that as a woman, as you can imagine, would be to use disparaging terms for women, you know, lower birth and so forth. Okay, men. And, um, Ah, uh, uh, this girl, this stupid girl doesn't know anything. But a Dakini told me once, <laughs> like that. And it kind of, um, it's culturally appropriate. And it also, um, I would say, fends off criticism, right? Um, it's just got a skillful purpose to it. So um, I don't know if that was her intention or not. I can't speak for Sarah Condra. <laughs> So um, it was predicted she be she would be the consort of that amazing llama she saw out the window so long ago, Drime Uzer, the son of the great Tertan Dujum Lingpa, who was himself a great Tertan and treasure revealer. If you have any questions, give me a holler, friends. And so um, then, but actually, when you look at the numbers, she they were together for two years before he died. Isn't that tragic? So, she, <laughs> but it, and yet it's marvelous. It's great. So she became, she propagated his treasures from then on. While they were together, she was treated respectfully and people suddenly knew who they were dealing with, that she was the real McCoy, as we would say. She was very learned and had indescribable accomplishment. She was from a wealthy family in Lhasa, so she knew how to read unlike most people, much less most girls. But then also she had this education from like Dujum Lingpa, hanging out with, you know, meditational deities and 
Guru Rinpoche, Yeshe Sogyal appearing to her and, you know, like having conversations, her personal, um, her personal education, Department of Education was uh, <laughs> always available. So she'd be hanging out with the Edoms or like that's like meditational deities, like we are hanging out with our buddies. She has a secret biography that describes this. I think I have that somewhere. One time she went to Riwache to teach the Dzogchen Nangjong. That's one of Dujo Mingpa's most important texts. There are three big monasteries there. One of the monas two of the monasteries treated her well. One treated her badly because she was a woman and not a nun. They'd say sarcastically, what an amazing lama. So beautiful. And with all those fancy clothes. So um, she wanted to meet a certain lama at that monastery, the one that didn't, where they, you know, talk trash about her. Uh, but they told her, you can't see him. And they told, kept telling her he was in retreat. They couldn't, she couldn't see him. She said, okay, just bring me his belt. But they did not. Later, she died and attained rainbow body. I haven't actually heard of her attaining rainbow body in other accounts, but Tukusanga is somehow related to Sarakandra. To, um, and uh, this is how he tells it. She left instructions that her door should be kept closed for seven days, but after four to five days, they could see through the planks of the walls that the house was filled with rainbows. Folks started peeking, peeking in. <laughs> so through the planks, they were supposed to leave her alone. They started looking in and seeing this rainbow light there. That, that doesn't always happen when somebody attains rainbow body. Usually it's a metaphor, but there were actually like rainbow lights swirling around. This is how the story comes down to us. And it was, it was, the light was kind of hovering in her clothing. Some people were scared. Um, there were letters made out of light that sp spelled Hari Nisa. So that's uh, Hari Nisa is uh, uh, mantric syllables that represent the Dakinis of the five Buddha families. The students wanted to break in early to get relics because her body was dissolving into light. And, they, and, and relics are very important, like bones and so forth from an uh, um, enlightened being. People receive a lot of blessings from those. They have a lot of faith in them. So they, at day five, they could only see, see only rainbows and fire shimmering at first. Like literally they went into the room and all they could see was rainbow and fire s shimmering. And they thrust their hand out into the light to get some remains before she completely dissolved. But the remains only the size of a torma were left. Torma, so like that or something. Depends on what size torma. The monastery had, that had opposed her felt really bad. The monks came out and confessed their mistake to her remains realizing, you know, they'd blown it. So that's the story as told by Tukusangak, as recalled by um, Yudin Wamo at the time, and asked Rinpoche to tell it again, then we get more details. I think it's important to get oral histories. If Christina Munson, Munson is a great translator of this material. Um, um, she's a student of um, Jato Rinpoche, Sangay Dorje, um, who passed to, into Peri Nirvana in a few years ago. Uh, Chachon Pache is uh, sort of the main holder in this, at least in exile, outside of Tibet. I don't know what's going on inside for um, her Terma tradition. And his daughter, Saraswati, Semo Saraswati, who's on Facebook, um, <laughs> Uh, is recognized as uh, incarnation of Sarah Kondra. Oh, touched my face. And then um, another recognition was made by Dujan Rinpoche of uh, a Dakini named Tare Lama. Uh, long story there. So there you go. So let's do a little... Um, That's wow, right? Can you imagine having that dedication, bravery? A woman traveling alone and through Go to Golok, based on having seen this Lama once and feeling a spiritual calling also. 
Unbelievable. Okay, I'm going to play a little movie I made this morning. It's with the Guru Yoga of Sarakandra that she wrote. And I just went outside and I was doing, I'm going to do my um, incense offering practice, but I just started um, reading scriptures by Sarakandra. And um, there wasn't any sound on this video when it came through, but I souped it up. Here we go. So at the end of this, merge your mind with, you'll see some images of her. Merge your mind with her's mind and rest there. I'm just going to rest in meditation. It's not very long, two minutes. I'm not hearing any sound. Hmm. It worked for me very recently. Well, interesting. I wonder if the Dakini is telling me not to play this. Hmm. It's pointless without the sound. So tell me, um, I've got my volume all the way up here. And the sound is halfway up there, turning it up higher. Oh, I see. Probably maybe I have to go to the movie. Let me see what I can do here with the sound. The practice of Guru Yoga. In front of me, in the sky above, upon the welcoming flower of my heart's devotion, is an emanation of Mother Yeshe Sugya manifesting as Sukhavajra, the embodiment of every refuge. Without ever separating, may you always be with me, blessing my body, speech, and mind as the three Vajras. K, Mother Wisdom Dakini, please hear me. The unmistaken meaning of the great perfection, the essence of all phenomena, is the key point of clear light wisdom awareness so that I not become sullied by stains of delusion. Please bless me to be liberated right now in the great unborn primordially pure ground, inseparable with your wisdom mind protectress. moment I receive your empowerment and blessings, may I realize a glorious dual benefit in this life. Kaya Waka Sita Sawa City Palahom Ah.
Okay. <laughs> you could hear it, but you couldn't hear me. <laughs> well, everything's a learning curve. Maybe at 300 of these, I'll get the, all the tech right. Thank you. It was very nice, very wonderful to make. Let's look at some of her words. Uh, you know, I haven't put it up on the screen yet. There we go. Her concise spiritual advice, which I think will sound very familiar. Uh, how incredible. I bow down before the single wisdom form of all the Buddhas. Gone before, present now, and still to come. Our guide, Dudu Wangchuk Lingpa, who is none other than Rigsun Kongkyong Lingpa, may we embrace the Buddhist teachings that inspire us to practice the essential sublime Dharma now. When we are enjoying excellent human lives, so hard to come by, and blessed with freedoms and advantages, recognizing that the phenomena of cyclic existence are impermanent and illusory, helps us to loosen our ties and attachments and clinging to them, such that alone we can reflect upon the fact that the time of death comes without warning, then we can actualize the true wisdom deity within our minds. Buddha taught the connection between actions and their results to be unfailing and undeceiving, enabling us to understand how we experience the results of our own prior goodness and negativity. So with certainty about this, let us be thorough and precise in what we do and do not do. Samsara is like a putrid swamp where we muck around in the sludge of insufferable misery. Think about this. Then go alone to the solitudes of the mountains and resolve your mind. Pray to your master and to the three jewels and strive to be wholesome physically, verbally, and mentally. Work to gather merit and wisdom by purifying your obscurations and protecting and freeing the lives of beings in danger. If you don't help yourself now while you're capable, no one will be there to liberate you in the future. So leave behind family and close friends and stop cherishing the wealth you've collected and even your precious body. When your consciousness journeys through the long treacheries that lie beyond death, the best protection is your master, the supreme jewel. So pray with devotion and make aspirations to see everything purely. Recite and spread the six syllables to benefit yourself and others. Negative friends are like poisonous, like a lair of snakes, and pull you and others down into gloominess. So stay by yourself, alone in the solitude of the mountains, and with the view, steady your mind by the iron hook of mindfulness. Use meditation to develop confidence in action and results and play close attention to the details of what to do and what not to do. In your behavior, love beings from all six realms as your own children. The ground is to stabilize bodhicitta, the foundation. The path is to realize the wisdom deity and the teachings for the benefit of beings. And the result brings yourself and others to the pure land of liberation. So she signs it, a beggar woman named Tara, who roams in samsara, wrote this to fulfill the request of one with devotion, the excellent, excellent Jigme, may it be virtuous. And we see that Christine Monson, Christina Monson translated this. Uh, Chatra Pache was quite um, protective of the... He was... Um, a master of masters, um, and he, P. 
people were afraid to upset him, rightly so. So, you know, he was, uh, and he was, didn't mince words. I, I never met Jacqueline Cushing, but I know people who did. So, um, every time, this, I think most of the times, the Sarakandro empowerments from her treasure teachings were given, they were approved by Chatron Pache. Or I think that uh, Zansa Kensir and Pache, I think Zansa Kensir and Pache received it from Dujim and Pache himself. And uh, I'm sure he talked to Chatron Pache about giving it. So, John. Uh, um, Sansa Kensir and Pache is a major linear, lineage holder of this, and he gave it last in the United States that I know of publicly, so quasi publicly in Santa Barbara about 2007. And before that, he'd given it Riggs and Ling, all the empowerments. So I, I, I was got to be there, of course, you know, I'm a devotee of Sarah Kondra. I was there, <laughs> uh, I was there in Santa Barbara, and then. The rest of the uh, reading transmissions that we didn't get there, um, I received later from Sansa Kensir Pache. So, um, and hopefully, um, Samo Saraswati Lukfuku will um, be a promulgator of this practice cycle. So, um, what else can we practice with? There's a wonderful, uh, uh, the English translations are kind of spread out through a booklet here and then a, in a practice book there. And then the largest one is that if you're receiving the teachings of Trekchit with uh, Tukul of Jimmy Wandrock and Pache, um, this is on the, based on the Nang Jong refining appearances. Uh, by Dujim Lingpa. This is a commentary by Sarah Kondro on that. That is uh, viewed as the most important of her writings. And back in the day, Lama Tartran Pache told me that it was actually viewed as a book of her husband, that her husband wrote it. So I think it was probably a collaborative process. Um, when they, it was always called Tukudrime's commentary back in the day. But now it's called Sarah Kondros, and um, they were inseparable. And just to show you, at one point I bought the four volumes of her treasures. Gosh, I took a picture. Let's see if I'm. Am I still showing you the desktop? Yes. I should go to the main main screen here. So. This is the traditional Pecha wrappings, very fancy one. Check out for this. Let's see, I'm going to shut up on this now a little bit. So Pechas, Pecha is what the page, is what these are called. So, you, they're stacked unbound stacks of pieces of paper. And ours have a little bit of English writing in there to describe what they are, but like just a line or two. Then it goes right into Tibetan. Gosh, I think this is upside down. But I wouldn't know because when I opened it up, I found out it was a kind of Tibetan script that I can't read. And yeah, I could learn. Mm, it's too bright. Let me try to turn the light down so you can see the pages. Mm. Well, it's kind of glare, still glary, isn't it? Let me bring up. We haven't done much meditation. I'm sorry. Hmm. That still hasn't carried over. I'm afraid I can't. I was going to bring over the photograph of the page so we can click. But anyway, it's a script that I can't read. And, um, and so it was uh, frustrating, but it doesn't really matter. I've got the blessings of this text and volumes in my house. And, uh, you know, honestly, 
when I was younger, I would have started all over and done Nundro, Sarakandra's Nundro, and then Sarakandra's Three Roots practices, and then Sarakandra's Trekshirin, and so forth. That's, I did one cycle after another, because I'm that kind of gal. Um, and then uh, you quickly realize they're all the same <laughs> in meaning. Ah, so I was going to show you... Um, I'm going to share with you a very precious thing that I have now misplaced. Here we go. Just now, three minutes till we're leaving. Well, I guess it's going to be five or ten minutes, but it's okay if you have to go. So, I, um, This will run over, but I'll, I'll read until it seems like it's time to stop reading. When I was 29, I was staying with my guru in isolated retreat at a place called Nima Lung in Amdo. This is the Dakini talking. There, a magical display of foremost divine spirits and demons manifested in my perception. They acted moody. And I told them, you should show respect and devotion to the master as you would to a deity. I also gave some other recommendations. So first of all, would that be your first thought if, if a, a ghost, a really mean looking ghost appeared in your bedroom? Or actually if you're way out in the middle of nowhere and there's nobody else there and this form appears? Do you think, oh, time to give Dharma teachings? Well, that's the way we should think. So she's role modeling that here. So she starts giving advice. So you should show respect and devotion to the master as you would to a deity. And she's talking about it. She was there with her husband, right? With her spiritual partner. Um, they said, if you're a yogini, what's the use of you being here? It would be better if you went into isolated retreat. I replied, I am in isolated retreat. Then they said, how is it, your isolated retreat? What kind of blessings might we feel if we stir up devotion? Please tell us. I reside in an isolated mountain retreat of limitless perception, where samsara and enlightenment ornament my experience. I cling neither to hope nor to fear, but rest within my mind's true nature steadily gazing upon my authentic face, innate luminosity. The instructions that reveal how perception becomes freed in and of itself, these I hold close. So I'm going to pause there and say, let's do that. I cling to neither hope nor fear, but rest in your own mind's true nature, steadily gazing upon my authentic face, innate luminosity. Don't think, I don't know what that is. Just do it. Okay, Let's see what else she said to these demons. I am free from desire in my isolated mountain retreat of self-luminous detachment where I luxuriate in the practice of lucidity. I bask there in the true nature of simplicity that arises of its own accord and gaze upon my genuine face, carefree openness. The teachings that show us how emotions untangle themselves, these I use. 
Let's bask in carefree openness. Simple carefree openness. My isolated mountain retreat is the natural arising of non-conceptuality. And my practice is simply remaining in that state where the circumstances of my life are inherently liberated. I encounter the wisdom of liberation that happens as a matter of course through maintaining the recognition of the true state beyond hope and fear. The instructions on this self-emergence and self-unraveling of thoughts these I employ. Isolated mountain retreat means I'm no longer controlled by hope and fear, but rest at ease while my emotions free themselves. I remain in my true nature, the perfect ongoing state of the three kayas, and behold my original face, effortless Dharmakaya. The instructions that reveal how samsara and enlightenment have always and forever been liberated, these are with me. I have attained four kinds of confidence that release me from the need to relinquish or attain anything, and I am liberated, inseparable, from ever excellent great bliss. This is the proper way a practitioner pursues isolated mountain retreat. Hey, hey, sleeping in the mountains is not isolated mountain retreat. Wild animals all sleep in the mountains. While far from butchers who kill, they have nowhere to go for protection or hope. Just thinking about this impresses me. All right, so I might do take take type two, take two next week. Try to. I might want to go further with this. Just tell me what you think. If you get a chance, even if you're not on any more on here right now, you can leave me a note in the comments section. Um, so what is she saying in that passage? Before we go, what's the meaning of what she was saying? The meaning of what she was saying is like, you don't have to be in an, a cave in the mountains to be an isolated mountain retreat. Your mind is your retreat cabin. And um, if you're always applying all the points of uh, how to rest, where to, where to, what kind of poise, place, mental placement to be in, um, holding the vast perspective. and the proper the yeah, proper view and then you're poising yourself poising balancing placing yourself gently in that state and remaining there as long as you're doing that you're in mountain retreat and who are your um, gods and demons well the gods are your, you know, all the thoughts about the future and hope and so forth. And what am I going to do? And I'm going to be so great. And oh, I'm going to go here and do that. And I see a cruise coming on. <laughs> I'll just become a demon, right? <laughs> and then fears, you know, and, you know, oh, God, I won't be able to do it. And 
I hate it when you meh, meh. Oh, and, and the sadness about the past and so forth as you do this. So they didn't disappear right then. She still had, she went on and talked more about um, the de how devotion to a spiritual teacher is really important. Okay, maybe I am done. I don't know. Let me know what you think. And uh, sorry, it was a little technically insufficient as usual. But I'm glad that this, you could hear the sound I finally figured out after I was done what, what was going on with that. Hey, have a wonderful week. It's, you know, it's, it's tough. It's tough out there. It's, if you're going out and about, my roommate works at Trader Joe's. It's like walking through zombie land. <laughs> you know, it's so, it's spooky out there with, with uh, none of the normal hustle and bustle of work, working people on the street and a lot of only desperate people out on the street in the city and Oh, you're welcome. And then, um, if you're staying home, it gets really, really boring, right? And um, I think we're looking at the body count. I think everybody's naturally. I think I, whenever I think, oh, I've progressed to the next phase. Oh, good. You can continue with Sarakandra. And, um, See, I hear Lori saying, if I can bring this up here, Lori. I'd love to continue with Sarakandra. Well, let's do that then. What the heck? We're the boss. So then um, it's hard, and I hope you are finding um, peace and satisfaction in your practice in your isolated mountain retreat, which now is very isolated <laughs> if, you're, if you're staying inside. You guys are working, but... Bye now. See you next week. Sorry for running off.